Hey, moron! Hey, moron! Duh! Look, look, look at me! I'm the woo water boy, duh! Oh, my goodness. Well, good morning, good people. Mark Holmes here, of course, with my buddy Cowboy Joe Boo. And as always, I want to say thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Boo Sports Report. Without you guys, as well as you ladies, you know that this literally, and I mean literally, does not work. It is Monday. We are 17 days away from kickoff of the 2020 season. Uh, a few more days for our Cowboys, of course, before they'll be kicking off. But we are getting closer and closer and closer. And I'm curious, I'm curious how you all are feeling right about now. You know, it, it's um, I, I'm truly blessed to have as many uh, fans and followers that I do. And I hope you guys hit the like button and follow along as well. But I have, um, like Ginger, who is a Seattle Seahawks fan, who can give us a different perspective of what the Cowboys are doing from the outside. Sometimes when you're dealing with a problem in a situation, you're too close to it that you can't actually be rational. And that's also where it's good to have, like my guy, uh, Leo, Leo Bridgewater. Shout out to Leo. He's an Eagle fan. He's going to be going to Dallas. He's, he's not scared like some of them, like Philly 500 and Dan Salio to show up in Dallas and things like that. He's going to be there standing up for his team, talking trash and everything else. Um, but he said something that was interesting that, you know, it, it's kind of cool that people who aren't Cowboy fans actually listen. Because I said what happens with the Dallas Cowboys is we are on Groundhog Day, so to speak. We lose in the playoffs like we're the only team that lost in the playoffs. That's that's the first thing. And they tell us how bad we are, even though there are teams that were literally ass-ass that couldn't even get to 500. But they make you feel like we are the worst, most inept team in the world that are in the playoffs. We get beat down. Then it comes to free agency, and you see teams that spend a whole bunch of money, and they anoint them as, oh, my God, they've done so much stuff. They're going to be a juggernaut. They're going to be, no, not the juggernaut. The juggernaut is Cooper BB. They're going to be great. They care about winning. They do so good, you know, and that they're going to be one of the best teams in football. Then comes the draft. The Cowboys don't make the sexy picks. They go through and they draft, you know, like a, a Tyler Smith or or a um, Cooper B. I'm sorry, a Tyler Smith or a uh, Tyler Guyton in the first round as opposed to going for the flash instead of getting another wide receiver or a big name running back and things. And they basically say, oh, you know, the whole hum, they, you know, they, they get a B minus in the draft and they beat you down on that. But then by the time you get to training camp and you start seeing some of the players where they actually have some players that are stepping in and performing like some of the players that they let go because, of course, they're cheap. They don't care about winning. They spend less money than anybody else. But I, even though we're not spending as much money as some of the teams that are out there, like the Jets or the Commanders, you know, some of these teams that every offseason that they spend so much money, they ain't even making the playoffs to lose early. So you have to look at it from the standpoint and say, maybe they do know something. Because I'm sitting here and thinking about every time, you know, the Giants that just paid $160 million last year for Daniel Jones, and he looks worse than Trey Lance that you got for a fourth-round draft pick. That I've seen teams that, like San Francisco, which are thought to be some of the best well ones, that literally spent three number ones to get Trey Lance that the Cowboys acquire for a fourth round. That the Cowboys found their franchise quarterback, who has been so good, he's been with the same team, that you look and say, we can't let that guy go because there aren't that many guys out there that can do what he does in the fourth round. As opposed to an Arizona team that literally took a quarterback in the first round in back-to-back -back years and still aren't sure that they have one. Or... That a Cleveland Brown team, so desperate after year after year after year, drafting quarterbacks said, let's go out and get one of the best ones in Deshaun Watson, 
who is getting paid $62 million this year, fully guaranteed, next year fully guaranteed, and the year after fully guaranteed. That, yes, the only knock you have on the Cowboys is they're not going to the Super Bowl and win it. I get it. But the last few years, there's only been a couple of teams. Kansas City, the Rams, and Tampa Bay. And about the last, what, five years, six years? That's it. All these other teams out here that you're saying are great. The Buffaloes, the Buffalo Bills. Oh, the Chargers, they got Justin Herbert. They, you know, they went out and got a Kellen Moore, or, you know, and, and things like that. Tampa Bay, I'm sorry, not Tampa Bay, Miami going out and getting Tariq Hill and having Jalen Waddle and getting Jalen Ramsey and all those things. They ain't doing any better than the Cowboys. And I'm not here to try and defend Jerry Jones. But what Leo is pointing out is what happens at this time of year is the narrative changes after they've literally trashed us and say, we suck, our front office doesn't know what they're doing, they screw the pooch and get the players pissed off because they don't pay them, they don't go out and address their needs through free agency, they suck. That changes to, are they a Super Bowl contender? Oh, they've got Super Bowl aspirations. This is a Super Bowl team. How the hell... Can you be a Super Bowl team if you've literally trashed just for the last six months and say we're dysfunctional? And that's what Leo pointed out. He was like, damn if Mark wasn't right. It's literally what happens. It's a whole cycle. And it's not new. I bring you some evidence even from the Dallas Cowboys flagship station. Listen. Oh, wrong one. Got too much shit here. Boom. And and I and I, you know, God bless the Cowboys. I know you guys are the flagship. They let you guys say whatever you want to say. For like I my time, my three years there, there's only one time, Sean, that they said, Yeah, don't ask that question. Everything else, it's been fair game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not everybody does that. We start Keep with listening. the Washington uh, commanders. Yes. That their flagship station saying, oh, thank God we can talk about the commanders now. <laughs> no, no longer affiliated with them. Right. So, but I looked at really, when I, Kevin, when I looked at just like a day-by-day timeline, you know, they beat the Eagles on January 8th. They lost two out of their three games, right? They blamed the officials for basically two of the three losses, which is terrible. Dak Prescott sits there and endorses fans throwing junk at officials after the San Francisco game. He has to come out and apologize. You've got a PR director who retires. Nobody, no big deal. Two weeks later, he has, there's this horrible story about him being accused of voyeurism, which he denied. Yep. But the Cowboys have to throw a $2.5 million check at four cheerleaders. Dak Prescott has another surgery. The Cowboys trade a wide receiver that they used the number one pick on back in 2018 in exchange for a fifth because the coaching staff doesn't like him, right? Then they give all this money to a guy who tore his ACL on January 2nd. Michael Gallup's not going to be ready for camp, right? Tank Lawrence is their best pass rusher. He comes back, which is, that's a highlight. Jerry Jones gets named in a, you know, Springer-like lawsuit. (laughs) Randy Gregory, whom the Cowboys stuck by, despite the fact that he had done nothing for them for years, gives them the middle finger, right, on a flip. Then they've got to cut Lyle Collins because the coaching staff didn't like him. Mm -hmm. But they kept their punter. (laughs) (laughs) Mac, Mac, why why is Stephen Jones the Alan Greenspan of the NFL? (laughs) That's a great one-liner, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, Because it's so – we see all these teams talk about, we're in cap hell, we're in cap hell. And then they go out and they trade for Tyreek Hill or they make these giant moves and add this big contract. I know the salary cap is a real thing. And, you know, I've talked to Stephen Jones, whom I like a lot, and he's, he has come to ad- admit and embrace the idea if you're going into free agency, that means you're overspending on that player because you made a big mistake two or three years ago. 
Okay, that's fine. That's that sound philosophy. Yeah. And mm-hmm. are you getting any better? Are the Dallas Cowboys today, no. today on March 23rd, pardon March, March 25th, are they any better today, Sean? No. No way. They were on. Okay. And no one, and no one, not even the biggest Homer fan. I mean, not even Mickey Spagnuolo would make that kick. M- Mickey might. <laughs> Mickey <laughs> might, but. He tried. <laughs> yeah, he would try, but I don't think. I- so this is the cycle that we go through. This is the cycle that we go through. And so we go through, now they will set up that it's Super Bowl or bust. That this is a great team. This is a great team. And they, they're better than everybody else. And if they don't win at all, then they're a disappointment. That's the cycle of being a Dallas Cowboy fan. So the question that they finished that off, shout out to 105 The Fan, to Shane and uh, RJ with Mac Angle. Are we better, are we a better team today than we were at the end of the season last year? We have a lot more potential. We have a lot of young pieces. And for those out there that are saying, if we don't win it all this year, we need to blow it up. Blowing it up says that we're just going to start all over. We're going to get rid of everything and just start over. But I look at this and I say, since Jason Garrett has left, the Dallas Cowboys don't have very many players that are left from the Jason Garrett era. You got Dak, of course, Zeke, who just came back, Zach Martin, Demarcus Lawrence, and who else? Can't remember when Jordan, maybe Jordan Lewis. That this team has already been rebuilt and you have so many playmakers. You got Diggs, who's coming back. You got Deron Bland, who's been a pick magnet. I know people will say he's trash because he's not a great cover guy. But you know what? I'll take a six or seven pick sixes in a season and give up a few p- plays here and there. I will say you've got one of the best players out there in Micah Parsons on your defense. That what you need is you need help. Say you've got one of the better quarterbacks in football right now. And instead of saying, let's get rid of him because we, of course, can go out and we'll find somebody else who's going to throw 36 TDs and only nine interceptions in a season. That's easy to do. Oh, yeah. Trey Lance is going to do that. Trey Lance is going to do that. I know Trey Lance, his stock is is risen some. He may have a chance to challenge Cooper Rush for the number two spot. But if you believe that he is ready to start and be the quarterback for the season, you don't really watch that much football. There's a difference night and day. Right now, it's not to say he can't down the road, but you're going to have a whole lot of growing pains until that time. But be that as it may, you sit there and look at the offensive line. Now, Zach Martin might retire next year. We don't know. But you got Tyler Smith that's there. You got Zach Martin. And you look at the potential where it's nice to actually see something Dallas Cowboys trending. CD, other than CD Lamb and Jerry Jones. Seeing Cooper Beebe and Tyler Guyton, where everybody is just amazed at how they are literally taking defensive linemen and knocking them around like they're a bowling ball going down the alley. That you look and say, oh my God, the Dallas Cowboys may have gotten two quality starting offensive linemen with one draft pick. With one draft pick. That may be two pieces that completely help to rebuild your offensive line. That the Dallas Cowboys literally, literally in the course of three years may have rebuilt an offensive line. Potentially. It's still early. It's still just two preseason games. It's still Cooper Beebe's really only second game of playing center. So I say pump the brakes a little bit. I say potentially. And you look at now that offensive line that's opening up holes for guys that are no-name running backs 
And actually, it'll begin to look a little bit better. The only thing that's holding them back at this moment would be is getting C.D. Lamb done. So, back to the original question. Are the Cowboys a better team right now, having worked on Mozzie Smith to be a better defensive lineman? We've only had one preseason game. He had the allergic reaction, so we didn't get a chance to see him this week. But I think the potential is there that he's going to be much better than he was. Going out and getting a Jordan Phillips, a veteran, to replace Hankins and bringing in a Carl Lawson to replace a Dorrance Armstrong. To go out and have an Eric Kendricks and bring back an Overshone and actually have in William Harvey, if he stops leaving the hole when he's in perfect position to make the tackle, looking like the linebacking core is better than what we had before. One other question I'll say that wasn't on my channel, it was actually on Game Time Bryans, is we have another resident Eagle, Eagle fan. Now, he's the polar opposite of Leo. Leo, CEO of a company that manufactures um, medicinal marijuana and helping veterans, a veteran himself, salute to you, my man, for everything that you've done for this country. He's a little more mellow. And I don't know if that's because of the business he's in or not. Drew is more of the regular Eagle fan that is just hate, 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 hate. Cowboy suck, 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 suck. And his thing was, because I said last year, when everybody was on the bandwagon and saying the Eagles are the best team, I said, you're going to have some issues with the new coordinators. They are changing the system and so on. I was told I was an idiot. They got all kinds of talent. You're just a hater. And it seemed like that was a fact, which is why those coordinators were replaced this year. And so Drew threw that back at me with Mike Zimmer and said, you're going to have problems. Why is it that my Eagles are going to have problems with the change in coordinators, but the Cowboys aren't? And I'll say, I don't know how your new defensive coordinator, because that's a similar system that they're running. The difference of what happened to the Eagles with their coordinator change versus the Cowboys was Mike McCarthy didn't start all over. Mike McCarthy changed about 30% of the offense and ended up keeping the things that worked well, supplementing. He ended up doing things like speeding it up so the quarterback didn't have to hold on to the ball as long and getting rid of some of the combination routes so that way it was right now. He took what they did well, kept it, and supplemented it as opposed to scratching and starting all over. Now, Drew will say that, you know, uh, Mike Zimmer's defense, he doesn't have the right personnel and so on. Well, Mike Zimmer is a 3-4-4-3 guy. He's done both. And what I will say is Mike Zimmer kept like Al Harris, who is probably one of the most underrated coaches, assistant coaches out there, that I look for him to become a defensive coordinator, who has done miracles with the defensive backfield of the Dallas Cowboys. Even through the first two preseason games, they got five takeaways. I'm not going to say they played great quarterback competition, but still, they're NFL players out there. That they're not changing as much as you think on there, and he's familiar with the organization, and he has really good players in positions and players that understand when you get an Eric Kendrick what the plan is. He can be the coach on the field that will help to supplement him. And I will say that the difference of the Cowboys being a better defense that just couldn't stop the run, as opposed to the Eagles that were like 31st, one of the worst teams in the NFL in pass coverage, that they have a long ways to go, that there wasn't a lot to salvage from there that you were doing correctly. And we'll see. I'm just a village idiot. I'll be the first one to admit that, that I don't know everything in the world. I just give you my opinion. And some people get triggered by my opinion and really want to go off. But again, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Now, there's some optimism, it seems, 
as far as C.D. Lamb's contract finally getting done. And we're going to finish up this morning here because I got some work I got to do because that's what I do. I hope you guys tune in tonight, 9 o'clock Eastern, for our live stream because you know how we do it. We always been doing it <coughs> for eight years now. Dan, take it away. The Cowboys still without their star receiver, C.D. Lamb. He's holding out for that contract extension. But prior to Saturday's preseason game with the Raiders, Jerry Jones had this to say regarding the status of his number one wideout. We're uh, uh, having the same kind of talks we've been having. Not worried about a target date. Not worried about his shape. Uh, glad he's not out here uh, risking some injury. I still don't understand that one. <laughs> That's Jerry for you. Glad he's not out here in the preseason. Uh, Jeff Darlington, give us a timeline on where, where are we with this C.D. Lamb Cowboy thing? Well, we certainly uh, we understand in some sense what Jerry Jones is saying there. There's no reason to risk injury, but he also isn't in camp at all right now. And quite frankly, the season is creeping us on, up on a September 8th being that, that date. So... Look, this could go down any day now. It really could. The, the problem with it, I, I say that on one hand. On the other hand, it really doesn't feel like they've gotten to a point where they know the annual salary, where they know the contract length, where they know the, the, real, the structure of the contract when it comes to guaranteed money. So, yes, it can all come together very quickly, but we don't really have any of those things feeling like there is any reason to think it's, it is imminent. So... The best I can tell you is that behind the scenes, the Cowboys remain optimistic. But until they get much closer to that number, that contract that Justin Jefferson has at $35 million a year, and maybe it doesn't have to be all the way there, we're not there yet. Uh, we still have three wide receivers, by the way, and Brandon Ayuk, uh, Chase, uh, who, who, am I, who am I talking about with the Bengals? Jamar Chase. Who's Jamar Chase. With, uh, Jamar Chase. Jamar Chase. Jamar Chase, Sorry. yes. And uh, Jamar Chase and CD Lamb. So we still got three wide receivers who are chasing those deals mm -hmm. uh, that the, the precedent was set with Justin Jefferson and we're still not there with any of those three. Two-tier question for you, Hawk. I'm mm -hmm. happy we got you here because as a receiver, you heard Jerry say, hey, I'm happy he's not here playing in the preseason. In other words, mm -hmm. he's not out here maybe getting hurt. But because he hasn't gotten, let's say, in the football shape, yeah. how long is that going to take for him to get ramped up because you 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 fear if he comes yeah. back and then they tweak something you're like oh my god had mm -hmm. he been in camp every football player knows the only way to get in shape for football is by playing football so he can be doing all the working out he wants to in the offseason until he's with his team until he's going through those reps in a consistent basis and feels the rigors of what the season is going to feel like his body is not going to truly be in shape and he's going to risk some soft tissue injuries or you know worst case even beyond i think also for this offense he is the most important part of the way that McCarthy and the Dallas Cowboys run their offense. It goes through him. And so you're actually not allowing the rest of the players on your offense to truly get their rhythm because you don't have that number one X receiver who is based in precision and the dink and dunk and take the shots who literally gets moved around the entirety of the thing for it to go. So if this deal gets done, what do you see as the ceiling for the Cowboys? I think they're a Super Bowl contender. Mm. I mean, you have the best receiver in go. football a year ago. You have a quarterback who was an MVP candidate. You have one of the best defenders in the National Football League. You have two all-pro corners. Like, yeah, I know it, it's easy to say, well, they didn't do anything in the offseason. They already had a really good team. They addressed the offensive line. Yes, there's running back issues. Yes, there's things on the defensive line that need to be fixed. Dan Quinn is probably the biggest, uh, you know, departure for the Cowboys. But then they have Mike Zimmer coming in. Yeah. Unless one plus one no longer equals two, you can't have a team with this much talent and not say that they are right up there with the best teams in the NFC. Happens the following week, teams use that as a little bit of a. We're not going to go heavy go. with what Our we're doing practice-wise or whatnot. Almost like a buy because training camp is five or six weeks long, and so you're talking about if the deal doesn't get done with CD this week then next week it's a little bit of a lighter week for most of your football team because you're dealing with your final cuts and roster so we're talking about even if it gets done in the next 10 days or two weeks we're talking three four five days maximum of practice real practice for cd going into the season the second element when it comes to our football team the biggest question is going to be how good those two young offensive linemen are cd lamb is going to play good football at some point this year i think the deal gets done but they drafted Guyton and Beebe, left tackle and center. Now, 
by all accounts, by both the tape and what people who I respect as offensive line viewpoint people, they say the Cowboys have hit on both of these players. And I trust their vantage point more than anybody's, essentially. Especially so yours. if those players are what they've shown to be at the start of preseason, I do think that this offense settles in to be a little bit better than I expected. But it's going to depend on how good those two rookie offensive linemen are realistically to what this football team can go achieve. What do you think, Jeff? I, I, to Dan's point, the deadline that they're looking for doesn't exist anymore. Like week one as your deadline to get this contract done is not a good deadline. I mean, that is the right. beginning of the season. So the problem yeah. with this negotiation at this point is that we have surpassed all of the previous benchmarks and deadlines to get this done. And now the only one remaining is week one. They're in a bad spot when it comes to trying to find a way to push this deal across the line because they don't have a good marker. If week one is your marker, that is not a good thing for this team. No, it's not. Yeah, I see you, I see you shaking your head. That's a fact. I mean, they, they, they need him in this offense. It literally yeah. runs through him. And so the, for Dak to be on timing, for Brandon Cooks, for Ferguson, all of those are complementary weapons to what CeeDee Lamb is bringing to the table. If he is not ready, if he is not yet in football shape, this puts you at a disadvantage. Okay, let's stay in the NFC. All right, we're going to leave it right there, good people. We'll see. I think that getting CeeDee Lamb in now is paramount to get this thing done so they don't derail another season. We've seen the Cowboys hurt themselves over and over because of contracts, only in the end to give in and pay a boatload of money. I'm Mark Holmes, and as always, I appreciate you guys. See you at 9 o'clock tonight.